Hi guys, welcome to another edition of The Big Shift. I have an unbelievable guest today. It has some unbelievable, iconic, historic mafia content from back in the days. You know, I'm talking Albert, Albert Anastasia, uh, Frank, Frank Costello, uh, the Gallo brothers. Hi, Frank. Thanks for coming on The Big Shift. How you doing, Steph? Thank you so much, man. I've read a lot of unbelievable stuff about you, uh, particularly about your father. So, you know, you, you, was, you was a mob associate, you know, you're a Brooklyn I, you know, from back in the days, you knew a lot of these iconic uh, guys. Your father was a bodyguard to Larry, Larry, Larry Gallo, is that correct? Yeah, that's how he started. My father was, um, my father started as a bouncer for Tony Bender in the uh, Peppermint Lounge in the Wagon Wheel in um, Manhattan. What happened was that uh, Larry and Joey were friends, Larry Gallo and Joey Gallo were friends with Tony Bender, and they were having a problem with Joe Pafacci, and they go to see uh, Tony Bender in his, his, his clubs in New York, and uh, my father just started working there as a bouncer. My father gets into a... a, 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 a into an argument with uh, some black guy there, and he winds up knocking the guy out with two punches. And Larry and Joey's there, and they see this, and the and the, and the guy happens to be a middleweight the champion, uh, Emil Griffin. So uh, Larry goes over to uh, Tony Bendix, who that guy is. He says, uh, "You know, Swift, the new bouncer." He goes, "Well, if you can't use him, he goes, we can use him down in uh, Fraser Street." And uh, that's how they met. And then a couple of weeks later, a couple of, some guy got killed in their crew. And there was a, in, uh, in, um, in Tony Bender's crew, somebody got killed. I think it was uh, Orgi Cabano got killed. And uh, Larry went back up to uh, Tony Bender and asked him to, uh, if we could come into Brooklyn. And that's how we got over with Larry and Joey through uh, Tony Bender. And that's how we get started with the Gallo brothers. Yeah. How old was you around this time, uh, Frank? I wasn't born yet. No, yeah, I was born. I was born. Of course I was born. Uh, I was, uh, what was it, that Tony Bender shit and stuff like that. I had to be four. Uh, I was about four. I was four. Because when the war started, like 61 to, to 63, I was about six like that. So... Uh, all that shit went over my head, you know what I mean? Except for the only thing I, I wrote, like I wrote, is that when uh, when um, Joey Maz got killed on Fourth Day on Union, I was there with my mother. I saw him get killed. He's one of the first guys that killed in the, in the Gallo Pafachi War. But I, like I said, it didn't affect me. It was that Cowboys and Indians? It really didn't affect me, you know. Uh, it was like a game, you know. So uh, it didn't affect me. But but I was young then. You know, those guys used to come in and pe pinch my cheek and, you know, and give me money. And, and uh, I didn't know any difference. Yeah, I'm just trying to get the timeline, you know, exactly so we can see where it is. Yeah. So, you know, them guys like, you know, you would have met them guys, like you're saying, you was young. You was young, Frank. So yeah. give, us a, give us a couple of couple of times you can remember, you know, if you can remember any times of me and Larry or Joey, you know, or any time they was around your father or they oh, come yeah. in the house or something like that, and you see them? No, Joe, Joey and Larry uh, was at my father's or we were at the, at the club with them all the time. So I saw Joey, Larry and Albert three, four times a week. You know what I mean? Uh, either at come on my father's house or my father going to one of the apartments or at the club. So we had three, four clubs on Fresno Street. So, so one of the guys were always around. And as a young boy, I was always around too. And and so I would see them often. But don't forget my father, Ricky, was put up, put uh, in 1962, when he came over, 61, 62, when he came over with Joey, Larry put him up in a, in a, in a bar in Brooklyn called the Hilltop. So he, he ran the bar the Hilltop, uh, Prospect Dale and Prospect West of Brooklyn. I was there all the time. I was shining shoes. I was six years old, seven years old. So you see these guys all the time, you know. Uh, and then and then Joey left. Don't forget, Joey left in the 63. So uh, I was young when Joey left, you know. Joey, I just know his smile, 
is laugh as a kid and him pinching my cheeks until I cried. Yeah, it's basically the way I know of Joe until he got back out of jail. You know, I was close with Larry the most quickly. Ricky was Larry's bodyguard. So wherever Rick, Larry had to go, Ricky had to drive him. So, and that was for a seven year run until Larry died. So, even even at that young age, you would have been very, very susceptible, Frank, right? And you would have kind of see a lot and a, cer a certain side, obviously, but you would still see some other stuff, right? Obviously, right? When you would have been there. To you, what was the difference between the brothers, between Larry, Larry and Joey, that you thought? How was they different in personality? Or was that or was they similar? No, they were hundred percent different. Larry was a very uh, well managed, very calm. Uh, he thought first before he leaped. Joey, uh, on the other end, you know, he would uh, leap, then think. He was really uh, old school gangster. You know what I mean? He was, Joey was, you know, a unique guy. And uh, they had definitely different personalities. But don't forget, Larry was the boss. Joey was under Larry. Joey was not the boss. They make everybody makes a thing, Joey, 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 Joey. But Joey was not the boss. Larry was the boss. Larry got mm. That's right. And um, you see Albert in there too, right? Oh, you see Albert was, yeah, Albert was the youngest brother. Yeah. You know, uh, he's another one who's come over, you know, he's with his brother, he's with someone, and he pinch your teeth, cheeks, or go on the side speaking about something. You know, these guys were all rough guys. So when you're coming up as a young boy, you, you hear the cursing, you hear the heavy voices. It's normal. I didn't see the difference. You know what I mean? Because especially Italian, in Italian uh, culture, we're a little rough, you know what I mean? You, even when we're, we're being nice, it, it sounds uh, uh, a little rough, you know what I mean? So, you know, my aunts and uncles were, were straight as an arrow. They talk, hey, oh, hey, you know what I mean? So, or, or, or rough, or, you know? So when you hear these guys cursing all the time or, or, or whispering or the mannerisms, it was, it was normal, normal to me anyway. Look, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff about uh, Lawrence, about Larry, right? You know, and there's a lot of other stuff as well about Joey. Crazy Joey, they call him. So, you know, you know, that's that hair trigger thing, right? The hair trigger thing. I'm getting it, you know, the temper and, uh, uh, you know, all of that stuff. But um, when you got older, fast, fast forward in a little bit, you know, you would have had a lot more understanding about, you know, the dynamics, you would have heard things, different stuff. Like, you know, there's a lot of been said about when Joey, Joey, Joey was killed that night on his birthday, right? Yes. What actually happened? What did you hear after the event about how, what preceded that and why he was, why he was murdered that night, for instance? We knew auto automatically what happened and who did it because the, the bodyguard to Joey is with us. So... We get a call from the sisters there, um, his, his wife, who wife is there. So we get a call right away. So we knew instantly who did it and, and, and pretty much why. You know why? Because it was an open contract on Joey. Everyone knew this. It open contract for a year, contract for a year. So there's no question of wondering why, you know what I mean? Where and how it happened, you know, is you know, up to debate. But uh, but we knew right away it was uh, it was and why. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's documented. It's well documented. He was sitting there on his birthday. You know, he had this girl there, the bodyguard there. I think the younger, you know, you know, there was a younger, younger, younger kid there, like the family or something. You know, and he come in the back. Yeah, 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 yeah. He come in the back. Uh, the guy just started shooting. Right, Joey ran out. He might, he might have been shooting. Joey got hit. Ran after him. And got shot again on the way door, and that's what killed him. Pete the Greek uh, got got hit in the ass uh, with one of the shots. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's the angle. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe he was ducking. I don't know. You gotta get shot after. Why not? What to do? Uh, and that's what happened. And then Pete the Greek, uh, who was a bodyguard that night, was uh, was uh, went to the hospital, and then arrested in a year for a gun charge. And pretty much we knew. Automatically from Pete, phone call from Pete right away what happened. So, mm -hmm. then, uh, and then, you know, then after that, you know, you, you have to do your homework of why, who did it, who was in the hit crew, you know, the crew that did. 
or what you're going to do about it. And there was a lot of other arguments there too because uh, Matty the Horse uh, owned uh, Umberto's at the time. He was a uh, made man with the Genovese family. And they, and this, they came in his place, brand new place, came in his place and, and shot two people. You, you don't do that. You don't do that. It's against the rules. Especially with a made man standing there. So Matty the Horse was pissed off at the at the guys who came and uh, did the hit. There was an argument there too, you know. Uh, then we had to beef by killing Joe in front of his uh, wife and his sister and the girl. And we just that turned into a whole shit show then too. Because on that side, who ran away, who went to the feds, who disappeared, you know. So the hit team was all gone. Whoever was involved with that, either they were killed or uh, they disappeared so they knew or they were went hiding, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, can you remember some of the fallout? You know, this brother Lawrence, like the other brothers. I mean, obviously, there's well, Larry was, you know, Larry, big shit over there, right? Larry, Do you remember Larry, anything that happened? Well, Larry was dead. Larry was, uh, Larry was dead just four years already. He died of cancer in 68. So, the last thing probably was running the show. And uh, the youngest brother, who's only one now he's the only one alive, so it goes to his hands. So, I mean, it was chaos then. Of course, when everybody got called into the, into the, out the president's street, everybody's trying to figure out where it came from, even though uh, Pete the Greek said that it was, you know, the guy who shot him, shot him, but we don't know why or who, why you do it, who's with him. So, you, you got to find all these things out. So, you know, who's bitter, you know, who's mad, who wants to just go shoot people, you know, you just scream, let's go shoot this guy, let's go shoot that guy, fuck him, let's do this, let's do that. It was chaos. You know, you need guys there, there was guys there trying to calm everything down. Had like Louis de Siri, Louis de Bella. He, he was like a concierge to, to the to, to Albert. And that, and he would calm everything down. And while everybody else was, you know, rock and roll. You know, everybody was really, you know, Joey was really, really, really well liked by his crew. It wasn't, like, you know, I'm not, I've been with other crews, I've been with other families, and I've never seen the, the, uh, passion for being with somebody. You know what I mean? I, I, I've been with two other guys since then and, and it was okay, we're with him. And by this fuck, you know what I mean? You really don't care, it's good money. Uh, but with being with Joe, we, it was a passion. Mm -hmm. If you're with this guy, you, you die with this guy, and you expect this guy to die with you, which he would. You know, so you had a lot of people upset. Which turned into then, what are we going to do? Yeah, it's a very... Uh... Historic, very historic uh, murder, Joey, Joey Gallo and the brothers, their journey, their journey, you know, their mob journey. Um, you know, I'm going to, you know, I know you know some unbelievable uh, historic stuff about Albert Anastasia and things like that. Before we get into that, Frank, I want to go back to your journey and your father's, right? Okay. You know, because I read even there was a, you know, there was a time there you went out with him where he was practicing to do a drive-by shooting. What's that about? Is that true? He used to, <laughs> well, he used to practice on a motorcycle with uh, with a with a with a Mac ten to do drive, to do a, a hit. He was he was um, he was going to try to go kill that. He hated this guy in the crew called uh, Mooney. He hated him with passion. And he wanted to. It was time that he was he was supposed to go. And he was practicing and I had to drive him on a motorcycle. And he drive by and spray, uh, see how, you know, on a motorcycle, how uh, Mac 10 would work. He was, you know, what he would throw uh, ball bearings at a, at a window to see how, how, he, how he would bust up, to stop a car. And he was pretty um, out there. How was the dynamic with your father? I mean, look, you know, there's a, yeah, yeah. we all have children in some ways, uh, a lot of fathers, they don't want their children to follow them. Others, they don't really care, right? They say, yeah, you know, this is what we do. How was it, how was it for you and your, and your father growing up? What did, he, what did he tell you to do, to be, Frank? My father? Yeah. I mean, I, I went to just a smooth way. When I was old enough to drive, I drove. When I was old enough to go do something, I was wrong, you know, said, oh, you got to do this, or you got to do that, or do you want to do this, or do you want to do that? It was automatic. I was with my father every day. You know what I mean, so when I got old, I was with him more. And I just automatically started driving and 
staying at the club, when you start staying at the club on your own, you, you, you start mingling with everybody, you learn everything, you get trusted if you're trusted because there's a lot of trust problems around with people, especially with money, with uh, people who are big, but the, the, those who are big with numbers and bookmaking, a lot of money's had to go, there's like ribbons had to go, pick up money, you had to drop with money, so you have to trust people. But once you get trusted to do something, you climb up a ladder, you know what I mean? So you just automatically flow into it. What I what they did do, what they did do to me is they kept me out of anything bad. You know, they wouldn't they wouldn't ask me as a young guy, because I was with his son, or send him to go hurt somebody, or send him to go uh, to do something bad. They wouldn't do that to me. You know what I mean? They had enough guys around that they wouldn't because if something happened to me, and Ricky would find out, then he would blow a ship. You know what I mean? So, yeah. they, they were, you know, my father was very, 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 very well liked in the family, in the crew, especially the crew. Uh, and they called him the Mad Hatter. They wouldn't, you know, they, you know, they wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't want to mess with him. So, he was a really dangerous guy. Well liked. In fact, loved amongst the crew, but don't, don't mess with him. You know? So, they, they were really careful with me. One thing you certainly see about about their life that I don't think people really get, they may start to get a bit more, is the accountability, Frank. It's, you know, the accountability within 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 the life, you know, to main men, what they do, who they do, what they do, every the structure of it, right? But look, let's go to um Albert, talk about Albert. You mentioned you mentioned uh, Albert there, the man out they used to call him Anastasia, right? Yeah. So, t- t- tell us about him as a person, Frank. What is your what was your understanding or your experience of the man as a person? He got he got killed when I was a baby, but, but, but we have my uncle George Japan was 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 with you, uh, uh, Anastasia and uh, Joe Adonis and uh, Frank Costello and. Channel. Josh Shep was really, really close. He wound up in lived very old and dying. He was ahead of all the unions. He took all the Frank Costello gave him all the power with the union and stuff like that. But Joe said that uh, Albert, which he was with Albert a lot, said that Albert was a really, really, really mean guy. He was not pleasant at all. There was no times at all that he was this guy was pleasant. He says old school gangster, and he did a lot of things he didn't suppose to do. You know, uh, big argument when he was going after a civilian guy, got killed, killed the guy. He says that he wasn't well liked, he was feared, but he wasn't well liked. So, mm-hmm. uh, when he got whacked, you know, 57, whatever it was, and no one cried. So, uh, 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 he, and he also said that, uh, he told me that, uh, that, uh, Albert's the one that whacked uh, uh, his boss. He said that, um, that uh, Albert Anastasia met, met up with, um, what's, his name? what's his name? Vincent Magano. I think Magano. I forgot. Or Phil Magano. One of them. Vincent or Phil. And that I mean, for me, in, in Red Hook, and that uh, uh, Albert killed him. And they, they put him out to sea. And that's what happened to Magano. So he was a Treachery was always there. He wasn't well liked, but feared, tremendously feared. You know what I mean? But uh, that's what Joe said about him. And this is a man that was with him. So I would take his word for name Joe said. Joe, Joe, uh, Joe Shepard was very, very, very well uh, respected. He was a Genovese man in the Genovese family. And he was well respected from, from everybody, from all five families. But Joe would make a statement like that, you know. You would tend to believe him. Um, he, he was killed in the Sheraton, running, you know, in the barbers getting his hair done, right? Yes. And um, you know, he had his, you know, he had his guys outside, his bodyguards or whatever was out there that day. Uh, Frank. So you know, the double cross was in. You yeah. know, they knew it was coming. They let them go straight through, right, and all that stuff. What transpired just before before that event? Have you any knowledge or anything that was said about why? What you know, I mean, there's sure he had a lot of enemies, right? You know, this is alive, but actually, what was what was the thing that led to the events of him being killed that day in the Sheraton Hotel? 
Vito Genovese and, and Carlo Cabrino got together. Vito wasn't crazy about uh, um, Albert. His album was friends with uh, Costello and, and uh, Lucky. And they, they pulled off a coup. Mm. They do it all the time. They've done it 10 times before that. They want to put, they want the, we don't want him out. And they put the uh, Carlo Campino in there. Don't forget, Carlo Campino is the underboss of, of, of the family. So they get to everybody. I mean, you get the underboss to get to the, to the uh, bodyguards. It's very easy. You know? You come walk, you're dead. You know, these guys don't have the love. They're going to walk. You know what I mean? Nobody, uh, you know, if you walk into bullets, what happens quickly, you know, you, you do it. And when you got time to think about it, you, you start thinking about it, you know, and, and you, you make a different decision. That's, they walked away and, and then and the guys went in there and killed them. Absolutely. And um, you knew a lot about the Colombo War as well, right? Well, yeah, I was in the middle of the Colombo War. That's what that's what I, where I was involved with, yeah. Did you know, you know, you must have knew some of them old time guys like Sonny, Sonny Francis and all them. Did you know them? Sonny Francis was a very good friend of my father's. He was to the war, after the war, and, uh, and um, until he died. You got to understand that these guys were all friends. Some guys didn't like each other, just like naturally. Because some guys just don't like each other in the same crew, in the same family. A lot of guys don't love each other. There are a lot of bullshit artists. They have to like somebody more, mm -hmm. you know, above them in some way, and you have to, you know, be nice to them. But a lot of people don't like each other. In, in, when this Gallo Pafacci uh, uh, Gallo Colombo war, these guys were dealing with each other from 63 or you know, 61, whatever it is. They've been dealing, they stopped dealing with each other during the, the Papachi War because they were both shooting each other. Then right after it was over, they had they were doing business again together again. They were drinking the same bars again. They were doing the same uh, scores together. I mean, some of them. So when the when the shit hit the fan again in uh, when Joey when Joey Colombo got shot, it, that's another headache again now because you got guys intermingling each other. It's the same family. Now, so, you know, a structure of a family is not that there was one family and another family. It's the same family. There's a different crew in the same family. So it really gets gets hard to figure it out. Who's with who? We got numbers together. We got clubs together. We got pickups together. together. The money together, yeah. Together. The money you, together, yeah. Now you start shooting each other. Maybe I don't want to shoot you, but... I'm with this guy. I'm with my skipper. So it gets really, really complicated. You know? And, and you, you usually go after the guys that you can get to. No matter whom it is. If you, once you go to you know, war with each other, you're going to go who, who you can grab. You know? And, and that's what winds up happening. You know? And uh, during the first, uh, the second, the, the club of war, you know, a lot of guys got the uh, uh, killed or shot in, in between, you know, but that didn't last long, you know, that was only about a year or two, you know, a year, about a year. What happened was that after that happened, after Joey got, Joey got killed in 72, uh, guys came down to, to, to put a stop to that, you know, from the Genovese and from the other families to try to, to uh, what do you call it, um, to make peace. So nobody wanted the bloodshed. So they came down and they put like a a, a, a cap on. It. Um, some guys got passes and some guys uh, walked on that. But a year, but a year later, the gals had it. In, their biggest argument was amongst themselves. In '73, uh, they had a breakup in the family in the, in the crew, and about ten guys pulled away and they went back to the Columbus and that's where from 73 to 76 is where the, uh, the last big uh, competition was that's when everybody started shooting each other that's what like when Steve Cirillo got killed and Punchy uh, Frank Liliano got shot and the Syrian got shot Steve, Bo Steve Borriello got shot a few other guys got killed that all happened from, from Break up in the crew and until 
eventually the gallows got released from the uh, the Colombos because it was such a fucking headache to them. <laughs> they released them and they went with the Genovese family and the gallows moved. By 76, 77, it was, that's all, you're, you're in the history books that by 77 because now it's all over. Yeah. So during that, during that, during that time, that war, Frank, how old was you then? You know, you know, we're going on a bit I now. Was, I, was, I, was, you? I was right in the middle of that. I got shot at. I was running guns. I was running money. I was bringing whatever you can do at, at, at that point. Some things I, I can't say, you know, what I did, because, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just, right, okay, okay look. I was right in the belt. I was right in the middle of that. That was, uh, I was the uh, 17, 18 dang, you know, what was that? You know, you're right. The picket then, you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I was, we, I ran a lot of guns around because guys were hiding out and I would know where they are. They were sending, you know, they were sending us, don't forget it. The, the police were on President Street with a barrack, with a police barrack, a barricade. We, we couldn't get off, the, you know, on or off the block without telling a, telling a police officer or detective where we were going. So it was very hard to move things around. Money, where you're going, you used to follow, especially guns. Guys needed guns, I mean, so you, you would have, it, would, it would be a big, big game. I would I, I would, <laughs> I would go out drinking, maybe let them go out drinking, pick my girlfriend up. And, and, and like a big farce, I would go out drinking all night, playing games, going out, uh, going for dinners, going like that, just to get out. So you leave me alone, and not follow us after a while. They say, oh, he's young, he, but they're going out drinking. They're about discontented. And then when they leave, we want to leave. It's like we want to go get a gun to bring it to someone. We had to go to hell to to, to move guns around because we were, they were watching us. Uh, you know, when guys want the lamb. You know, who is trust to get them? But needs money. But needs food. You know what I mean? So. It, it was a, it was a game we played with the law, and it, it was it wasn't easy, but you know. But, but being young, you know, and the law after a while would, would think that you you know you know you're just going out having a good night with your girlfriend, you know, and they will leave you alone after after six hours, you know, and mm -hmm. then you go do what you got to do. So it, it was a game that had to be done, you know. We played it, you know, uh, and stuff like that. You know, when you're locked down on the block, people shooting at you. And, and uh, can't move around too good. The money still has to be made. There's, there's pickups to be made. There's you know shot money. They have to be dropped off. There's ribbons. You know the world don't stop. You know so you have to uh, class go. Well, um, what? Yeah, that would have been a difficult time. You know I see that <laughs> unbelievable, especially where they're locking everything down. And must have been a uh, yeah. You can't crazy. earn. That's the problem. You can't earn. I mean, you can sit on the block and drink and have fun, bring the girls down. But you gotta eat. You gotta make money, and, and that's what what the hardest thing was to do was to make money. Yeah. And, you know, that's let me good. ask you. Let me ask you, Frank. Look, you know, I mean, since you know Rico and uh, you know all the bosses of the five families, they got indicted, and you know all that stuff went on. You know all that history. There's been a lot of changes, you know, you know, to the uh, to the New York La Costa Nostra families, right? It's well documented. But look, I want to ask you one of them older guys, right? I mean, it's obviously changed now so much. Well, what do you think about how it was back then and what you see today, Frank, really? What I read today, because, you know, I'm not around nobody, you know, but... What I read today. What you read today, yeah. Sorry, you know what you what you what you get today. What you kind of read. What you whole, understand about it today. A whole different game. You know these guys. You know they weren't brought up with the the old school gangsters to give them the you know the rules and regulations or the uh, you know the the oath to to be what we, what we uh, want to be. Uh, you got they have so much uh, technology against them. Um, the laws are built, to, you know, to bring them down. Uh, they don't have the smarts to avoid it. You see, they always get themselves in trouble with their mouths and phone and cell phones. I mean, they've been saying for years, they off the phone, they off the phone, to their phone. They, they're threatening somebody on the phone again. Either they're stupid or they have bad memory or, or they don't care. Mm -hmm. They don't care. They go to jail. That's why I laugh. I laugh when they will go to jail because my father used to say, the smart ones stay out of jail. To go rob something, get caught, you're an asshole. 
you got to block something and not get caught. You know what I mean? So, you know, I go to jail, I don't care. But well, you're stupid. That's not what we're here for. You know? But it's just a different. Rico killed them. Uh, they make guys different now for different reasons. Uh, when I was a young guy, I never heard nobody a rat. I never knew nobody was a rat. And I saw a royalty or I saw, don't forget, I was around guys like, you know, you know, Fat Tony, Funza Wild, the Chin, you know, those guys were, you know, old school guys, real old school guys that you don't even say that fucking word in front of them. These guys, uh, that's all they do is pull each other rats and rat in each other. There's been you know, 4,000 guys in the last 30 years. I mean, prior to that, there were maybe two. It was, that's you know, just I mean, it's a whole new world, you know. I've been out of it so long because of rats and stuff like that, because we were with, with uh, Andy Rotunda with the Jersey crew at the end. And they all, and they all went bad. Everybody flipped and everybody um, became informants and everybody uh, ratted on each other and we walked away. But that was it after that. After that treachery and how the boss of the family that we were involved with, you know, was, you know, flipped so easily. Uh, that was it. We washed our hands of this. The mass was going to want to become a street criminal yourself. Forget about being with anybody. It, 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 so the question is, from what your understanding, what you read, or what you know, when you kind of been in that life, even though you transform your life and you're so much out of it, you know, you still have a depth. You, you know, you can see stuff, you understand stuff in a different way. You look at stuff, right? You know, so you know, for you, you know, for you, I mean, is, is the mafia still there? You know, in that way, is it underground? You know, I mean, I don't expect you to, but you know, people have said it's still there, but it's all different now. You know, we don't kill anyone anymore. You know, because there's a, you know, a moratorium on killing and all this stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, look, business is business, Frank. You know, you know that. Business has to be done just the way everyone does business to survive. I mean, it's as easy as that, right? Business progresses. It has to prosper. I mean, I have to say, when the when the killing is taken out of it and the violence, this is much better. You know, obviously, this is much better. Of course. You know, I mean, the feuds is another thing, right? We, 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 you can't solve them with some guys. This is a problem, right? You know what it was like when you're in that life. Exactly. You know, it's do or die, right? You have to change with the times. It's, of course, they're still there, man. There's criminals, yeah. criminals everywhere. There's criminals. It's Albanians. They're Russians. They're Chinese. They're black. They're, you know, I mean, we don't got the, the only guys around. You know, we're just the most popular guys. I mean, like to write about and, and that we're just more flamboyant. It just, it's just different breed of guys are coming up. You know, they do different things. You know, they're more underground. They're more, they're more tech, tech wise. You know, uh, they had to change with the times. You know, yeah. we're not as flashy as we were. We took our money and bought diamonds and put, and put three piece suits on with alligator shoes and we went out drinking and, and flashed what we did. You know, we were flashy clubs, you know, uh, you know, and, and stuff like that. We hung out together more. We went, you know, uh, it was flashy times. That's what we did. Uh, now, you know, they're, they're barbecuing in the backyard, you know, in short shorts. And they're a little low-key because the law's all over them, you know? There's, you got cameras everywhere, man. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a different... They're at, they're at a, they're at a, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, a disadvantage now. So, you know, to, are they... I think they're different to us. Do I think they're as tough as us? I don't know. Anybody can kill anybody. You know what I mean? I, I, I know, know. I know. It's a tough world. It doesn't matter. I know a you know. guy killed a good friend of mine because he was scared of him and, and popped him. And the guy was big as, as, a, as a football player and killed him in two seconds. Because, only because he was afraid of him. And, and he killed him. He was 15, 16. He was skinny as a rock. And fierce. Anybody can kill anybody. Um, it's just a different philosophy now. Uh, to, uh, you know, you know. Once I started writing, once I started with the magazine, you know, I, I, I walked out of the life completely because you can't do both. Because it looks bad. I have some friends. I do have a few friends now that we, we talk, but we don't like to go out no more because, I mean, I've been doing this so long. Everybody knows who I am. Uh, it looks bad. Let's like it comes stories or something like that. So you know, you don't stay with your friend because you know no more. But I do, you know, get the scuttlebutt what's going on now and then. And, Different breed and different problems than we had, 
and they try to overcome it, and uh, it, it will go on. So, Frank, let me ask you, you know, I know what it's like to live so many years around this kind of stuff, prison and, you know, and all of this kind of stuff, right, the violence and all that. Um, what made you leave the life, Frank? We left the life because in 1999, you know, I was, I was proposed to be made in 1999, by three of us, we were made in the, in the jury with him. And uh, my father sat down with me, grabbed me and told me that uh, you, me and a couple of, not to mention names, I'll be got a pause of each made in the Kikaltanke family in Jersey. It's okay. And he said to me, you know that he gets rained out and you fuck up because you know I'm the one that's going to kill you. He leaned over, he grabbed my hand because you know I'm going to kill you. And I said, okay, I'll make sure I don't do nothing wrong. And about a month later, uh, our skipper, who we were with, and the crew, Anthony Thunder, wanted to get arrested with him. 10, 20 other guys, all the higher guys in Jersey, the boss, other boys, all the skippers, because all gets arrested. And what happened was, our guy, Andrew Rotunda, was in jail for a year. And what happened after a year, probably word comes out, we get word that he, they took him out of circulation. Once we took him out of circulation, we know he flipped. So now, our skipper flipped. We didn't know that this was the boss of the family skip uh, uh, flipped. In the oceans, he flipped. So now he flipped, the boss flipped, the other boss flipped, another skipper flipped, and there's two guys in in, 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 the, in the crew that were shooters that did, did some murders. They flipped. So now everybody's in trouble. So what happened was we were part of the Brooklyn crew and that Jersey family. So a lot of guys not too familiar with us because we were Anthony the Thunder in that group. Uh, at that time, a couple of old guys passed away too. So when uh, Anthony wanted to come and go into the witness protection program, that crew scattered. Who went to Jersey? Who went try to get released to go somewhere else? And who just sat there back? So my father turned to me, Ricky turned around and says, you don't do nothing until they call. We get no calls. No one kept call. No one called because number one, everyone was afraid to rat on each other. This guy, the guys in Jersey didn't know us that well. They wanted to call us in. They didn't know how the hell we were personally. So they didn't call us in, ask us nothing. They don't want to open themselves up. So they just we just walked away. So Ricky turned around and said, "I'm done with all these rats." It's a big case. We still got to worry about if if Anthony flips and gives us up on. A few things, you know, what I mean, uh, that he could have gave us up on. He goes, We have to sit and wait for that. So he goes, That's it. We're done. He packed up. We went to Florida. And he said, That's it. Don't take no calls. And that's how we walked away. And that was 2001. That was pretty much our way. And no one called. <laughs> I should have mentioned they did. But look, you know, I mean, uh, life, life, life is a progression, you know, and it's a, it's a, uh, Sometimes something you didn't thought, you know, can happen. You know, can really happen. You know, so what do you think? Uh, what do you think now? Looking back, Frank, you know, is it the best thing that happened to you leaving this life that you'd known all them years, or not? I, 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 I yeah, just out of common sense, had to be the best thing. You know, uh, do you miss certain things? Yeah, I mean, of course, you miss a lot of things. I miss a, a, a lot of things, but. So yes, the best thing that happened to you. I would recommend it for life, no one. You know what I mean? Especially, you know, after so many years and and uh, got grandchildren and, and stuff like that. No, I don't recommend it. It's, it's not good. It's not good. It never ends up. It very rarely ends ends well. Uh, I, we ended well because we just wanted lucky ones. You know what I mean? But there's thousands that don't that uh, wind up in jail or wind up dead. So yes, uh, you know. To, you know, it's like living two different lives. The first life is in, in, in the limelight, being involved with Joey and all that stuff, which is a trip and a half. And then the second part of your life, you got to live like a like a common person. It's a whole different world. Now you you're from here down down here. You know what I mean? It's like your mind. You know, if you remember, yeah. then and then you got to live. Like it's this. different. 
it's different worlds, Frank. You know, I mean, look, you know, I had a very traumatic time when I was a kid. I, all of them years I was involved, uh, you know, in all the organised crime stuff. You know, the guys over in my family who I was round and, you know, it wasn't your stuff, but it was very serious. The same kind of, same kind of dynamics. I went to prison, 17 years, our security, shooting at police, armed robbery, um, you know, all of this kind of stuff. Come out, um... You know, the truth is for me, I wanted out of that life for a long time. You know, when I was in there, I mean, I'd done 12 years in one, in one straight through. I mean, I was horrendous, right? That's you right. know, I wanted out of that life for a long time. And, you know, it is what it is. I'd never done no harm to no one. I played by the rules. I'd done my share. I'd done uh, 10 people's share. That was just my story. You know, uh, uh, Frank, I yeah. come out of it. I went on. Oh. I've, uh, you know, and I've worked and I, I'm... It was a part of my life, Frank. I'm happy I'm away from all that. The truth is it never it never worked for me, Frank. What yeah. I do now, I have a wonderful life. When yeah. I was stuck in that, yeah. I was I was always cornered. You know, it was always bad news. Yeah. But down the road was always a dark day, even though even though, even though yeah, you know, there was good times, you what? know, and some glamour and all that stuff. But really it wasn't paying off, Frank. That's the truth, right? You know, it wasn't what paying you off. For it. <laughs> that's my experience, right? You know, I have to say that I have to put it out there because it's the truth. You know, pe people can make of it what they will. You know, that's their, yeah. that's their, that's their, that's their prerogative. You know, um, so how how do you find the neighbourhood today? Uh, what you do today? Tell us about what you do today. You know, I know you do a lot of other stuff, and what do you do today, Frank? We've always been in the in the publishing distributing business. So, uh, in 2007, I started that Mark Kenny magazine with a, with a friend of mine, Tyrone or Christopher. It did well, you know. Uh, so, we, we, I've been doing that for the last, uh, I did that from 2007 to, to, to uh, 2013 and something like that. And then 2014, I started writing, you know. And in the last five years, I've been writing books. So that's what I do. I, either, I mean, I come out with a magazine anytime I want. You know, I mean, it, it, it's, it's, it's all there. You know, I just got to print it. You know what I mean? Just wait for a good time to do so. This, this, this wasn't a good time, you know, the last year and a half with the, with the uh, pandemic. But uh, I'm, another magazine is coming out. I just write, man. I write, you know, uh, and I just relax. You know, you know, I just sit around, have to no. go, and, you know, I don't work no more, so... Mm. I'm pretty much retired, so I just sit around and, you know, yeah, I wrote the script for the uh, for the Pleasant Street Boys. I got the script about the Joey Gal. I got the script, and, you know, I try to send it out here and there and try to get some, some bites on it, but, you know, some bar, no bites, you know. And I'm not the one, I'm not the type of guy to, to go up everybody's ass and pushy and, you know, I'm not going to do that. I send it to like, you like, you don't like it, and, you know, it goes yeah, back to yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. you know, should be the way. <laughs> I want to ask you, yeah, I'll get that. I really do, Frank. Look, I, I want to ask you one more question about the old days because this is coming there and I, I, look, you know, I mean, I try and get different slants on this from different guys as well. So I ask the same question because it's a pivotal question in mob history. Is that, look, uh, John Gotti, right? You know, on the front of Time magazine and all. We all know the story and all that. With with Sammy, right? Sammy Sammy Gravano. Now look, do you? A lot of people are saying, and there's different slants on this. As I said, do you think that because there's always been flamboyant gangsters, even in the old school, they was different, but you still had the flam flamboyant types, Frank, right? Yeah. So, do you think it's fair to say when they say about John? Now they say they jump on the bandwagon and they say. Oh, you know, he was on the front of Time magazine, which I get, I get, right? You know, it's not helpful, right? Let's be honest. He was the beginning of the end. Really, it was him. He was the catalyst of all of that stuff, you know, and then Sammy Gravano, what transpired after that, where it was the beginning of the end for the New York mob. What's your view on that? Well, I don't think it, I don't think it ended. So beginning of what end? I mean, well, it, that... It's been, it's been a, it's been twenty years and, and he still get hoodlums are getting arrested every day. Yeah, 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 get yeah, yeah. Wasn't getting arrested. That period, that period, that period, ah, though. That nah. period maybe. Nah. Was he too flamboyant and did he bring too much attention to himself? Yes, he did. The guy was an egotistical guy. I mean, 
you're, you're not dealing, these guys are gangsters. I think a hundred times, I tell everybody a hundred times, you're not dealing with normal people that have nine to five jobs that pet their dog. These guys are, they have to go maniacs, man. They kill people. How you, how you rational, you say, well, John did it. This is one gangster that's a, that's a psychopath like the rest of us at one point. And then you want to, then you want to say that, oh, he did this wrong, he did that wrong. Yeah. They're nuts. They're, they're killers. They're nuts. You want to rationalize what, what nuts do? This guy was a flamboyant one. Did it, did it destroy him? It destroyed him. But that was his choice. You know what I mean? You, you can't. But no, no one told John that. He demanded, he demanded, you know, respect. He demanded everybody come in. He had hundreds of captains. He, they came in and, and didn't say nothing then. You know what I mean? You know, be in other people's shoes. You have to, you know, to be to, to talk about it later. You've got to be in their shoes. You know what I mean? These guys are psychopaths, man. You know, you're not, you know, it's, they're not regular people. So when outsiders or people that you know love to read stuff try to, you know, they make statements of, oh, he, 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 he brought down a map. Rationalize it. Rationalize something that can't be rationalized. Exactly. You, and you want to give an opinion? No rules. You're not there. You're not there. You don't know why. Like, Sam, like Sammy, they could. Sammy's a rat. Yes, Sammy did rat. He did it, man. But we're not in his shoes. You don't know why his passions were. You know, because, you know, these guys, you know, these gangsters and people, as much as I love you, I'm going to kill you. You know what I'm saying? That's how this shit works, man. So when it, when it, Sammy could have got, you know, we don't know what John said to Sammy. Mm. We don't know what was said between them. That's what you got to go in the shoes. You, these guys are psychopaths. They could have said one word he didn't like, and you switch. Now, from loving you, I'm going to kill you. Yes, it is. That's how it works. You that's know, that's the reality. The, that's the like reality that. of it. Uh, both of us know that. You know, when you're dealing with the, you know, that kind, the of people, of that kind of end. You know, look, a lot of guys don't want to go to jail. It's the Bible of fittest. Like I get people get scorned. I mean, you know, it's like everything else. You know, I, you know, I don't, I don't particularly care for people that flip. I don't particularly care for you know, but I don't badmouth them and I don't talk about it because you got to be in their shoes. Everyone's different. Until you get in their shoes, you don't know. Especially when there's different circumstances around. You know, I mean, if, if you get caught with something and you just wanna you don't want to go to jail, then you're an ass and then you're a bad person. But when people do things to you, like you just changes you know, the dynamic, doesn't it, Frank? Right? You know, they were different, it can change the whole thing. It's all other people to say, yeah. you know, don't know anything. You know, this is a fascinating part. You know, I mean, I yeah. told you my part, what I done, you know, when I was in there, how I took my choices. But you know, who am I? I'm just, you know, I'm just saying exactly. that was the path that I took. As I, that was the path I came to. I was yeah. happy to be out of the life. So there yeah. are a lot of different things going on here. So, th thanks for that because you know, there's a a lot of changes now. You know, there's a lot of guys. I talk to a lot of guys. Definitely. You know, I don't judge anyone, Frank. I mean, who the fuck am I to judge no one? One thing I don't judge is anyone. Maybe they judge me. I mean, exactly. I'm not a fucking judge, right? Do you understand? I, I don't care about that. It's the matter. Yeah. No, but I hear their stories, Frank. Yeah. I hear their stories. I like some. You know, I like some of them. I do. Yeah, yeah. they're interesting. I do. You know, you know, they have um, you know, they've had unbelievable journeys and they, you know, they tell me their story, you know, and I I I get many parts of it. I really do because I'm not fucking stupid. I'm not thick, oh, right? Exactly. So, I know. I met I met Sammy. I met Sammy the Bull a few times. You guys no joke. You know, guy was no joke. You know what I mean? So now you know you talk about you pulling things like that. I, I would just keep your, your, your you know his, his name out of your mouth. You're not in his shoes. But it's you know, but it's good entertainment. It's good reading. You know, but uh, I, I just stay away from it. And uh, that's it. That's why most of the stuff I write, they're dead people. Yeah. Or they, or they died already. And Frank, look, you know, I'm not saying I condone that. I mean, if someone's a bad person, they put their name to something with their friends, they're all into together, and they turn and just glance on them. Yeah. He's, he's a wrong in my book. There's no way out of that, right? Yes. You know, I never done this. And I took, you know, I, I lost everything not to fucking do this. Exactly. That's my choice. That's what I'm saying. But look, you know, it is what it is. And um, it's good we have a, you know, a chat about that. Because there's yep. so much that comes out at the moment. And I think one of the things, one of the things that is annoying 
is people are so quick to talk about something they have no idea of. Not even a, no not even a little bit of an idea. No, 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 no. Know the whole thing. You're never going to know the whole thing. But if you have no fucking idea at all what you're talking about, right? Unless you look at one of these guys' eyes and you see that, or you're in a situation yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, somebody's brain's blowing all over the place or the fear or the tension. Just to... Uh, uh, you never experienced that, then you don't know nothing. What you are is yeah, a, yeah, yeah. Just like we are reading and telling stories. You gotta look into a murderer's eyes and, and then tell me when you when you you're scared to see the bombard of you and shit your pants. And keep doing it, you know, keep doing it, you know, uh, week after week, month after month, year after year. I see something really, really interesting in your in your story, Frank, that really jumped out at me. Because I have the same, right? It's well documented, you know, my story. Some people have seen it all over the press here and, you know, all over the place as well, right? You know, there's some stuff going on about my history and that, and books and different stuff of the film coming out, a documentary. But apart from all that, one of the things was where it says that when you was young, you see your first guy or person killed in front of you when you were six. Is that right? Yeah. Yes. Bill Max killed. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Basically, Joe, Joe Madsen was a, a, a gallo with Joey and Larry. He was, uh, you know, I see him all the time, you, you know, as a young boy. And uh, I was, we were on 4th Avenue Atlantic in Brooklyn, Atlantic Avenue, I'm sorry, 4th Avenue Union Street in Brooklyn. I was coming out of the house with my mother. We were on the corner. I see Joe Madsen across the street in front of a diner. And he started arguing with another guy, two other guys. And, 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 uh, Within seconds, I heard, you know, two big bangs, and you saw them drop. And I, we just, I just stood there watching. My mother grabbed me and, you know, shuffled me away. And uh, basically, no, I wasn't taken back. I, it was Cowboys Indian stuff, you know. So the you know, real, is it real? It wasn't real. It wasn't, you know. You, it, yeah, it doesn't seem real. real. It was, you know. I saw afterwards everybody was, you know, hurt and, and, and you know, a lot of people crying and stuff afterwards. Uh, but did it affect me? No, even when I got old, it didn't affect me because it is what it is, you know. It didn't affect me then. I'm not, I don't want to, 20 years later, I go see a psychiatrist. And I didn't give a shit then. I don't, know, I don't care now, you know what I mean? Um, uh, that's about it. He was a young guy with the gallows that, you know, hot headed and, you know, he leaped before he, he thought, and then he, he wanted to get killed in the streets. And that's basically. That's interesting, uh, Frank. I'll tell you why. Because I see a guy killed in front of me when I was seven. I'm just a year older. When I was in Belfast, because I was born in the UK, but taken over there when I was six months, six months born babies. I come back, you know, to London, East London, you know, when I was nine, right? Yeah. Well, when I was over there and I was seven in the middle of the war over there, there was the, the war, like the, the bombing, the, you know, the sure. guns and all that, the riots over there. I got stuck in a riot, you know, and there was one of them guys, you know, he had a gun and all that. The army shot him. So he died, you know, now looking back, you know, he was only kind of been more than uh, 20, 21, this guy then. I was seven. But he actually died in front of me, Frank. I was behind this hedge because I couldn't move because of, the suppression fire, you know, was up and down the road. Anyone move, they, you know, they die on that road that day. So I was stuck, you know, and I had to watch this guy die, call, call him for his mother. And 20 minutes I was there. So this is, you know, this is documented. Yeah. That was traumatic for me in the way I was stuck there, all right? It wasn't like you <laughs> see that happen, you think, did it happen? God, that's shocking. It did, it didn't. And this kind of, you... You know, you kind of removed. I couldn't go nowhere, Frank. I right. was stuck there. Yeah. So I had a different thing. And you know what? Look, you know, I mean, I went on, I, you know, I caused a blazing trail after that. I was angry, right? I was really angry and all sorts of stuff happened, to, you know. And that, but, but um, I didn't even speak of that until seven years ago in any great detail. I'm just saying it's funny how this stuff can translate in us as human beings, right? Sure, definitely. You know, I, you know, I was around a lot of guys that got shot or killed. So it's, you know, it does affect you. But I was taught in, in the head, you know, in, in my head that it's business. Mm. 
So yeah. it takes away the, the you know the oomph of your heart in, in, in certain ways. Uh, it's business, you know, and I had to, and I had yeah. to instill that in my head. Well, I wouldn't understand what the hell's going on. You know what I mean? So, uh, I mean, God, you know, I mean, it's just funny how that paradox is as I'm thinking because soon after that on the journey, don't forget I'm seven, I got so dehumanized seeing these people exactly. die in front of me after. 100%. I was, I was an empty fucking shell. Yeah. Really. And I had to reverse engineer myself as a human being. Um, yeah. uh, Frank, you know, really. Definitely. Come back to being a human being. I mean, that was the that was the first thing. So it, it's just you know, I found that fascinating and a synergy, you know, in our two stories certainly. Definitely. Look, you know, um, thank, thanks for taking time out of your day today in Brooklyn. How is Brooklyn today? Brooklyn's pretty nice. I'm gonna go outside and have a cigar. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice out today. Yeah. It is here too. It is here too. A little cold, but. Nice, you know. So, look, Frank uh, DiMatteo, I want to thank you, really thank you for coming on, you know, discussing uh, some of them old guys, the iconic guys, your experiences with them, you know, your thoughts, your view on a lot of different stuff. And uh, really, thanks thanks for coming on, Frank. Send them to my website. Yeah, what is your website, you know, in your books? Uh, yeah, website's uh, mobcandymag.com. Dot com. You get all of my books, all the magazines, you get all everything I have on the website. Photos, nice pictures of beautiful girls, nice stuff. Everything you want is there. Mobcandyman.com. There you go, guys. Uh, I advise you go in there. This is a real guy. You, you know, real stuff, iconic, historic stuff. Back in the days, he's got unbelievable tales to tell. We've only, we've only just. Scratch the service, you know. I know that I know you're a wonderful, wonderful writer as well, Frank. And Thank again, you. thanks for coming on the big shift. Thank you, Stephen. Keep in touch. I'm here, man. Thanks for tuning in, guys, to a wonderful new segment of the big shift with Stephen Gillen. Make sure to subscribe, like, go into stephengillen.com and sign up for more wonderful content to expedite, help and support you on your own personal journey of success.